this is Angela with Parkos Permaculture. I'm standing in the backyard of my Portland, Oregon permaculture garden. We are in zone 9A. Used to be 8B, but um, climate change, we're now in 9A. So it is mid-August, but it really feels like late September. If the last few days it has been rainy, it's usually very dry this time, very dry this time of year. It's usually wildfire season, it's smoky. It's hard to get out and garden because the air quality is often so bad, but we have had a reprieve this year, um, knock, on, knock on wood. That means that the air quality has been surprisingly good. And also things are much greener than they otherwise would be because it's rained for multiple days in a row. And I know that that maybe is too good to last. I know it's supposed to get hot again the end of this week but right now it really feels like autumn it's been cold at night and um, by cold I mean like in the low 50s and I am noticing that things in the garden also are kind of sensing that we're moving toward autumn and so there's been quite a bit of change one of the tasks that I usually do in August is that I prune my rambling roses and I have two ramblers I have Cecile Brunner which is just a stunner. I am, I have a love-hate relationship with Cecile, like I do with many of my roses, because she's incredibly thorny. And like all ramblers, she only blooms once, but she blooms very early and with a huge, dramatic, very fragrant show. I have a couple videos on Cecile. And so, you know, I keep her around. I love her. I love her. But she is really a beast to prune and a beast to take care of. And then I also have a rose over here, which is um, a German rose that is technically a rambler. She only blooms once and has small purple open blossoms. And that means that the pollinators can easily access the nectar and pollen from this type of rose. Those really ornate ruffly roses are, you know, harder for pollinators to access. Simple open face flowers are best if you want to attract pollinators. So this this rose grows over a cattle panel arch. I used to have it just against this post here behind for a number of years. And I thought, I want to add some more cattle panel arches. So I put one in here and I've been training it over this arch for a few years and it works really well. I have to tie down the lead uh, stems on my rose and then I use hemp so that everything is compostable at the end. But then because this only blooms once, and because of the way that ramblers bloom, I need to get the pruning and tying down done in August. Unlike my shrub roses or some of my climbers that I actually prune in February, um, these have to be done in August or I won't get any blooms next year if I wait until too late. So that's what I've been working on this morning. I have some plans for things farther down in the garden later today and I'll probably film that as well. I feel like three or four videos kind of stacked up together that I'll probably have out over the next couple days because I'm doing a lot in the garden today. I also have to pick blackberries and blueberries and more plums. So busy day outdoors and the weather could not be any better. So while I am pruning roses, including very thorny roses, I wanted to talk about how we deal with our prunings and with composting in a permaculture system, especially like maybe an urban permaculture system where you don't have room for massive compost heaps, or maybe you deal, you deal with rodents who are attracted to the heat of a compost heap, how you do that. For me, there are several things that I do not compost on site. I gave up composting in a heap many years ago because because um, we get rodents and because it's a warm place for them in the winter and I don't want to give them any excuse to hang out in my yard. So I stopped composting in heaps. I do trench compost quite a bit. And I also compost at the end of the season when all my annuals are done, I pull things up and put them back on the beds. I also do chop and drop during the season. But there are lots of things I don't compost here, including all of my rose prunings. And for that, I use the municipal compost. In permaculture, we ideally want a closed system, right? Where nothing is leaving our site. We don't need to bring in import any nutrients. We don't need to ship waste off site. We can take care of everything right here. But, you know, that doesn't necessarily work in an urban permaculture system to think about the limits of our, of our system as the edge of our property line, right? So when we stick to the thinking of everything has to stay in my garden and I can't import things from outside my garden, it just doesn't work when you're looking at, you know, a tenth of an acre or a quarter of an acre. It's just not possible. So I obviously import things. Um, I produce a lot of biomass on site, including manure from my poultry, but I do import things like goat manure, rabbit manure. I am, you know, rock dust minerals. I bring those things into my garden as well because my garden is 
um, too small and also has had a lot of those things leave the site, right? Especially a rainy climate, a lot of the nutrients in the soil were washed away also. So, you know, I'm working to add biomass always because I started with a garden that had no topsoil. It was just subsoil and weeds and sod. And that means that I want to keep as much as possible on site. But I also want to think about the reality that I cannot have a closed system definition end at my property line. I have to think about my whole community, right? I've talked before about how in permaculture we have these zones. And when you have a small yard, thinking about the zones extending out into your community, especially zones four and five, how helpful that is versus trying to cram them all into a small property. I think closed systems are very much like that. So I have been working very hard the last few days and will continue today to work on pruning and collecting and weeding those things that will go off of my property into the municipal municipal compost where they will get composted and they will get utilized in the community. We have free compost days here in Portland. We also have lots and lots of companies that buy the municipal compost and use it. So I know that this is not gonna end up in the dump. It's not gonna be in the garbage. It's gonna get returned to the earth, but not in my garden because I don't have space to compost it or it might be something that is weedy and I don't hot compost so I cannot guarantee that weed seeds will not proliferate if I just throw them back on the bed. I want to send those off to a hot compost where they get killed and um, that way the biomass can still be useful without perpetuating the cycle of weeds in the garden. So really quickly things that I don't compost on site are weeds that have gone to seed or fruited. These aren't mature, but there are mature fruits on this. This is the Solanum nigrum, the black nightshade, which technically is edible, but it's very weedy here in Oregon. And then other kind of spurgy plants that I don't want. And also I tend to compost my roses offsite because they take so long to break down. These big old thorns that the municipal compost which is high temperature therefore can break down weed seeds and more pathogens and works much quicker um, i'm gonna let them take care of those so even though ideally we like closed systems in permaculture uh, the reality is that it's best for a lot of us to compost off-site if we have municipal compost available so you can see that i have untied all of the roses went all the way down here and some of them got tangled in my apples and I had to do a little a little pruning there by the way this apple here is Ashmead's kernel and it's almost ripe it's almost ripe I tasted one two days ago and it's just about ready to get picked so all of the places where this bloomed I'm gonna prune those back and I'm going to bend these long shoots. I'm going to bend them down, all of these puppies here, and they're going to get tied down across here and they will be the runners that will flower next year. So loads and loads and loads that I'm going to have to prune off even though I've gotten about half of it done. And you can see the old mature rosewood. You can see the old mature rosewood here. This is sort of my scaffolding here and then the, f the flowering wood is kind of up here more. So I'm gonna be tying these back, I'm gonna bend them over, tie them back, and then also remove all of these bits that have bloomed. So quite a bit of work to do. So I just wanna encourage you, if you have a small garden and you're like, how do I get a closed system? How I'm, I'm frustrated I'm not upholding this permaculture concept of needing to have a closed system. Think beyond the edge of your property. Think about utilizing resources within your community and including that as part of your system. Because the, the reality is, if, well, I mean, everything in permaculture is connected, but especially when we have small gardens, our pollinators are not just staying in our yard, they're going to our neighbor's yards. And we have all kinds of you know, circumstances where water is moving from one yard to another, our yard might be shaded by a neighbor's tree. The way that our system is set up and run is not limited to our property line. And I think we need to be aware that it's really good. It's a good and, and important goal. It's something to keep in mind, something that helps in our design planning to think about having a closed system. But let's be more expansive in our understanding of where the borders of our system really are and how if we have especially urban gardening, urban permaculture, that we need to be inclusive of our whole community and consider that bigger picture when we're thinking about what it means to have a closed system. So 
I'm gonna get back to pruning, put on my, my big rose gloves and my hand pruners. And please don't forget to click like and subscribe. And please consider supporting this channel. There's a thanks button here on YouTube. And I also have some ways down below in the video description if, you, if you're interested in supporting my channel monetarily. So um, thanks again for watching. Thank you for your continued support through likes and subscribes and clicks and, and comments. I appreciate all of that. And I'll be back real soon.